Hi everyone, I'm Taylor Purvis. I'm a uh, physician anesthesiologist at Mass General. I'm a resident right now. And I'm gonna talk to you a little bit tonight about a, a day in the life of an anesthesiologist and why you should consider anesthesiology. Um, I am a, a senior MST um, USMLE tutor, which basically means I help students prepare for the kind of medical school board exam equivalents. Um, so kind of the, the equivalent of the you know, MCAT for medical school. And I've been working with MST for about two years. And I'm really excited to be here tonight to talk to you about what a career in anesthesia looks like. So tonight, what we're going to cover uh, is we're going to talk about sort of my path to anesthesiology and how I picked it as a specialty. We'll talk a little bit about the residency structure of anesthesiology, if that is something you decide to go into. What the different specialties are within anesthesiology, because believe it or not, you can get even narrower in your focus. If anesthesia wasn't specific enough, you can do just sort of general anesthesiology, um, and then a variety of other things, which we'll go over in, in great detail. And then we'll do a wrap up and a Q and A. So I've been a tutor for a little over two years, almost two and a half years now. I started tutoring really at the end of medical school, my last year, and then uh, really tutored through uh, step one, uh, step two, step three. And again, these are all different types of big exams that people take during medical school. So really, as I took each of these exams, I kind of um, got certified to, to tutor for that um, at, as I took each exam. And then I also helped prepare students for the kind of clerkship exams in medical school. So for example, when you do kind of your one class, your obstetrics class or your clerkship, you usually take an exam at the end of it, the standardized exam that everyone takes around the country. And so I help students prepare for that. It's a wonderful company. If you ever find yourself in a position where you need tutoring, um, you know, really pre-med through residency and the boards and um, even, um, you know, physicians kind of at my stage of training, we offer tutoring. So if you ever need help, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can reach out to me directly. Um, you can also just, uh, you know, go online and, and look at the website and find someone that you think might be a good match for you. We've been doing this for about 15 plus years and um, we're a bunch of people who really like to teach and wanna make the process a little bit more enjoyable. So don't hesitate to reach out to us whenever you think you might need us. So I would love to hear, I'll talk a little bit about where I'm from and um, kind of where I went to school, but I would love to hear from all the participants. Maybe you can type in the chat box, um, you know, where, where you're from or kind of what, what year you are in your, in your studies. Nice. We'll talk about what post -back programs, uh, why they're wonderful and why everyone should consider doing them if they haven't already. Very cool. So I was born in Singapore and then went to California and then sort of migrated my way around the country. Um, I did my undergrad at Yale and then did a post back program at Bryn Mawr College, which is right outside of, um, right outside of, sorry, I was distracted by the Bay Area. I'm, I grew up in the Bay Area. So I uh, did my post back program at Bryn Mawr, which was a one year program. I really loved it. Um, a post back program in case I think we have some people, it looks like who are really familiar with it right in the thick of it, but it's basically a one or two year program that really focuses just on your pre-med classes. So the reason I chose this was because I did, I studied the humanities as an undergraduate and really didn't focus on the pre-med sciences at all. So I um, kind of deferred that for my, to, to my um, year at Bryn Mawr, really enjoy it and highly recommend it. If anyone has any questions about that post back program, please don't hesitate to let me know. I then did two years of research at the Brigham in Boston um, and loved it. I kind of was deciding whether I should do an MD or an MD PhD program, ended up deciding just to do the MD program and did that at Hopkins in Baltimore. 
And after the four years there, I went to, um, actually did my intern, I forgot to put it on the slide, but I did my intern year, which we'll talk about, uh, in Connecticut at a small community hospital close to home, um, my, my now home, and then went to Boston um, at Mass General, which is where I am now and where I'm doing my anesthesia program. So this will kind of make sense. There's a lot of different terminology about how res like the residency structure, um, which can be kind of confusing. The details really aren't important, um, but just to give you a sense of my path, I talked a little bit about this, but one thing I wanted to emphasize was that you really don't have to have a traditional path. It sounds like we have some people on here who are post back. I would say that um, med schools are definitely moving in the direction where they like older students and they like students who have kind of a unusual CV or unusual resume and unusual experiences. I, you know, it's probably 50, 50 people who take time off before medical school and people who go straight through. So you're certainly not at a disadvantage if you go straight through, but, um, the, the point I'm trying to make is really medical school is more open-minded than you would think in terms of their admissions. What they like is to see people who are excited about what they're learning, um, really invested in their education uh, and really have a strong connection to medicine. But it doesn't have to be kind of your typical connection to medicine that you think of. It doesn't have to be shadowing at a hospital. It doesn't have to be, you know, volunteering at a hospital, sort of those traditional ways that we think about. Mine was, I, I really got involved in sleep medicine research. My um, friend in college was diagnosed with a sleep disorder and I just found it really fascinating. And so I started getting involved in research without any medical experience. I just was a humanities major who reached out to someone by email um, and said, Hey, I'm kind of interested in sleep. It's really a peculiar field. Can I help you with your research? Um, and then that's, en that ended up being what I did for the two years during my research years at the Brigham. Um, and then in medical school, just to talk a little bit about like why anesthesiology and how that happened, um, I really was undifferentiated. That's often the word people use, meaning I had really no idea what I wanted to do for the first two years. And then we went into our clinical clerkships. So the first two years were kind of you're going to lecture, learning from textbooks, learning everything about medicine. And then you go into your clinical clerkships, which means you're sort of on the, on the wards, right? You're in the hospital, seeing patients, um, trying to rotate through surgery and internal medicine and obstetrics and all of these different things and trying to find out sort of what you want to devote the rest of your life to. I felt like I was probably interested in a surgical specialty. And then I did my surgery rotation and didn't love it um, and ended up just saying, you know what, I'm not really sure what I want to do. So I'm going to do an elective in anesthesiology. Schools are different. Some medical schools require every medical student to rotate through anesthesiology and do maybe a one or two week um, rotation in anesthesia, but I just did it as an elective. I actually did it over spring break because I didn't have time in my schedule um, and really loved it and decided to uh, spend kind of the summer after my third year. So the third or fourth, third, the summer before my last year, um, doing more advanced electives in anesthesiology and trying to specifically look at chronic pain, which is a subspecialty of anesthesia, which I thought maybe I'd be interested in because I, I kind of liked neurology. I kind of liked psychiatry, um, but I also like procedures. So I really wanted to try that out. And then research while I was in medical school, I was also kind of interested in spine, spine pathology, neurology, spine surgery. Um, so I sort of got exposed to anesthesia that way and specifically with blood management. So this may not seem intuitive, uh, but you know, anesthesia, in addition to kind of what you typically think of as just putting people to sleep and keeping them asleep, we're really the ones who manage, who kind of keep the patient alive during a surgery, right? We're giving them all of these medications that, um, keep them from kind of breathing naturally, uh, keep their blood pressure down. And so we have to give medications to try to, you know, um, essentially sustain their life during, during surgery, um, because it is a pretty artificial environment. So one of the things that we do whenever there's a surgery, when there's a lot of blood loss, we're really the ones who manage um, replacement of the blood. So I know, I feel like it's not really something you think of your knee jerk association with anesthesiology isn't sort of 
fluids and giving blood and that sort of thing. But that's really something that we um, very much manage and are very focused on. So I was interested in kind of um, the benefits, but also the harm that can happen from giving too many blood transfusions, because sometimes you can't have too much of a good thing. So I kind of got exposed to anesthesia from a couple of different directions, not just the elective, but also through research. So I'd really encourage you um, in, you know, not just in your undergraduate studies or your post back, but when you get into medical school, I really encourage you to try to get involved into many, as many different types of research as you can, because even if you don't have a rotation on a certain specialty, you know, your school may not have a dedicated uh, rotation for dermatology, for example, or anesthesiology. Um, and sometimes it can be hard to fit these electives in during your, in your schedule, which is always really full of required courses. So research is a great way to get exposed to that, especially any kind of interdisciplinary research that you can do. Um, and so I basically decided that my summer after third year that I was interested in anesthesia and residency applications are due um, the fall of your fourth year, your last year. So I, I pretty much decided maybe two months, three months before residency application that I wanted to do anesthesia and I kind of collected my letters and applied to it. So the take home point here is that I, I think anesthesia, um, people get to it in a lot of different ways. I will say it's a very common story that if you ask an anesthesia resident, they typically will say, I thought I was interested in surgery, but then I did my surgery rotation. I didn't really love it, but I like procedures and I like being in the operating room. That's a very common refrain that you will hear. Um, and I think, I think for those people, anesthesia really is an attractive field, but there also are, if you don't love being in the operating room, that's actually okay because there are fields like chronic pain, for example, or regional or acute pain where you can be out of the operating room most of the time uh, and still be an anesthesiologist. So the residency structure, just to give you a sense, I think this is an important thing to think about whenever you're deciding on a specialty is how long do you, how long are you going to be a resident? Um, you know, it's, it's a tough time of your life in the sense that it's kind of, you don't have a lot of control over your schedule. Obviously certain residencies are kind of not easier, but the, the hours are better for certain residencies than others. And anesthesia, I think, is generally a, a more pleasant residency than other ones in terms of the hours that you work. Um, but it is something to think about. You know, do you want to be in a residency program that's like nine years long? Um, are you okay with doing one that's five years long or four years long? So it shouldn't make or break your decision, but it is something important to be aware of. Um, so the residency structure you'll hear these terms thrown around, but it's basically um, four years in essence. So by the time you graduate medical school, you have to do four years of kind of an approved program. And then you are eligible to take your boards and become a board certified anesthesiologist. So four years is really what we're talking about after medical school. There are two ways to accomplish the four years. Um, one is to do a categorical program where you do all four years at the same institution. Um, this is becoming more and more popular. So a lot of programs do this. Uh, Duke residency does Brigham and women's does it. Um, I think Hopkins is moving more towards this. A lot of residency programs are sort of half of their students or half of their residents kind of do this structure and half do the other structure. But the idea is a categorical program is kind of nice because let's say you want to do your anesthesia training at Duke and you want to spend your intern year that first year at Duke as well. You kind of get to know the system, get to know the hospital, the electronic medical record. You kind of, by the time you start your anesthesia, really only anesthesia focused your second year, you know everything there is to know about Duke, for example. Um, so that's the benefit of a categorical program. The other way you can do it is do what they call one in three. So this means you do your internship somewhere else. And then you do your advanced training, also known as your like anesthesia training, your three-year anesthesia training at your advanced institution. And the nice thing is if you do this one in three structure, you can actually apply 
to both of them at the same time. So for example, on match day, when I, I found out where I was going for the next four years, I got essentially two envelopes saying your first year, you're going to be spending in Connecticut doing your internship. And the next three years, you're going to be spend, you're going to spend it at Mass General doing your advanced anesthesia training. Um, one thing I will say is this is, this is kind of nice if, um, for example, you want your first year, maybe you need to stay near a partner. Maybe you want to be near family and live at home for the first year. Maybe you just want an easier um, first year because you like the idea of working at a nice nearby community hospital that has lots of free food and good bagels. Um, and you don't really want to work at an academic center for that first year. Um, so that's, that's something that, uh, is nice to think about that. There is a lot of flexibility and you can really do that first year in internal medicine. You can do it in surgery. You can do it in pediatrics, or you can do what's called a transitional year, which is kind of like medical school all over again, where you jump around to different specialties. So if you choose this one in three structure, you do your internship one place, and then you do your advanced training at kind of your final destination, like mass general. And then for anesthesia, every fellowship is one year. So if you want additional training and additional certification in a subspecialty, which we'll talk about, um, then you can do fellowship. So either four or five years is really what you're going to be looking at. Um, this is a great question um, about um, kind of when you're kind of how long do most anesthesiologists practice? Um, I think generally most anesthesiologists, it depends on whether you're private practice or academic. So what that means is you can either work for kind of an academic teaching hospital. So this would be the Mass Generals, the Yale New Haven, the Stanford University, all of these sort of big university you know, training centers. Um, they call that academic medicine. And I think academic anesthesia tends to have reputation for being a better work-life balance, um, four days a week in the operating room as a, and you don't take, especially as you get more senior, um, you don't take as many calls, you're not working as many weekends, that sort of thing. So what I, what I see a lot of, even at, at Mass General, I saw this a lot at Hopkins, um, is that people will work in private practice anesthesia, maybe until they're um, kind of, you know, 45 or 50 or so, and then they will move on to an academic center where they can kind of teach the next generation of anesthesiologists and have a little bit of a better schedule. Um, and so I would say most of the anesthesiologists that kind of move into that academic setting tend to retire around 65, 60. Private practice, if you just sort of stick with that your whole life, um, I think they tend to retire earlier. One, because the hours are a little more intense um, and also because the compensation is better. So in private practice, you do make more money, but you are putting in more time. So I think people tend to retire a little bit earlier. Um, but in general, it seems to be you know, a pretty good work-life balance compared to other um, to other specialties and other fields. So people tend to last a pretty long time, so to speak. Um, and anesthesia, one of the other really nice things about it um, is that it really lends itself to kind of non-clinical careers, if that's something that you're interested in. So anesthesia gives you a really great exposure to the inner workings of the hospital because essentially anesthesia is actually the group, that's the group of people that are running the OR schedule. So believe it or not, it's really not the surgeons who get to decide, can I book my case into this OR tomorrow? Can I add on this wait list case? Um, can I make sure that I'm operating six days a week? It's actually the anesthesiologist, uh, much to their disappointment. It's the anesthesiologist that decide like, do we have enough staff to run the operating rooms? Um, you know, do we have enough uh, anesthesiologists here and um, surgical staff and things like that? Um, so really anesthesia has a very good exposure to kind of how to run, how to run a hospital essentially. And keep in mind that the ORs are really the bulk of um, where the bulk of a hospital's um, 
money comes from. So it really comes from especially like orthopedic uh, or elective surgeries are really where hospitals get most of their money from. It's not from kind of inpatient medicine, for example. Um, not that that's necessarily a good thing, but because of that, I think anesthesiologists have often been um, kind of natural choices for hospital administration. If you're interested in that sort of thing, if you're kind of interested in running a hospital one day, um, generally a, a lot of anesthesiologists fill that role just because they're pretty good at kind of managing personnel and scheduling and that sort of thing. Um, and anesthesia is also, of course, very familiar with pharmacology because you're dealing with medications every day, you're administering them yourself, you're really the only doctor that administers medications, if you think about it, it's kind of an odd concept, but um, because of that, I think anesthesiologists have a really um, natural fit into uh, you know, pharmaceutical companies, if you decide you don't really want to do clinical medicine forever, and maybe you want to go into pharma, or you want to go into biotech. Um, so it's really a nice specialty for that reason as well. It's a great question. So we talked about the prelim year, that that first year that that um, kind of intern year, essentially, what you'll get is exposure to general medicine. So the idea is that first year of your four years of residency training for anesthesia, they want to make sure you're a really competent general medicine doctor. You're not going to be as knowledgeable or skilled as someone who completes a three year residency program in medicine, in internal medicine, right? But you are supposed to really be able to understand um, kind of a, a broad, um, you're supposed to really have a broad fact base. Um, they also expect you to do one to two months of intensive care. Um, you're not supposed to do two more than two months. I ended up doing like five because of COVID, but you're supposed to get some exposure to intensive care and then a month of emergency medicine. So this is really supposed to be kind of a foundational year that has nothing to do with anesthesia. So literally your first year out of the four years of anesthesia training, you do not do anesthesia. Um, so it can be kind of a frustrating time if you really wanted to do anesthesia, but it is very good experience. Um, and you do things like rounding on the wards and we're working with interdisciplinary teams, doing admissions and discharges, things that you'll really never do again um, as part of anesthesia, unless you're in the intensive care unit on anesthesia. Um, but it is a very good experience and a very important um, exposure to have just because moving forward, you will be kind of asking yourself lots of questions about um, you know, patients who are gonna be undergoing surgery the next day. You're gonna be have to be familiar with all of their comorbidities, um, all of their medical conditions that they have, all of the medications that they're on, and you're gonna be expected to deal with those conditions through the stressor of general anesthesia, which can be very taxing on someone's body. Um, so this is what the, the first year is about. And then a lot of people say, well, what are, you know, once you kind of get to the next three years of anesthesia, what does your day look like? What are sort of the ABCs of anesthesia? And this is always the joke that every surgical person will ever make to you if you're in anesthesia. And it's not very funny by the time you hear it the 50th time, but the idea is the ABCs are airway bagel coffee, meaning you sort of place an airway, you leave the room, um, patients asleep, they're breathing on a ventilator, so you don't really have to do anything. And then you go upstairs and you get your bagel and your coffee. There is some truth to this in that anesthesia is very big on breaks. Um, I like that. The C is for chair. Yes. Um, I have also heard there's another B I've heard like books. Um, C is like for candy. Yeah. That's basically the idea is that, you know, you're sitting down. It's not like being a surgeon, you get breaks. And this is definitely true where um, let's say you start your first case at 7:45 in the morning, you sort of get the patient stable and then someone comes into the room and relieves you, so to speak. Um, so they kind of take over the case for about 15 minutes while you go get your bagel and your coffee. And this indeed does happen every morning around 9:30. 30 or 10. And it really frustrates surgeons to no end because, you know, they're like, you just started your morning. Why do you need a break right now? But it's just part of the tradition. And then you get a 30 minute lunch break and then you get another 15 minute break later in the afternoon. And, um, it's basically 
uh, every hospital does this. So there is definitely a reputation for anesthesia being a much friendlier environment than surgery. Uh, you do get to sit down. So if you're someone like me who kind of vasovagled or, you know, almost passed out every time they stood for too long during surgery, this is a really nice choice because you still get to be in the OR, but it's just a little more comfortable. Um, so some truth to this. Anesthesia has a bunch of different specialties if you decide to go that route. So again, these would be decisions you could make, the th things you could do if you do a fellowship. So if you do another one year. If you don't do a fellowship, which is totally an option, you can do general anesthesia, meaning like you would apply to a job. If you're, you know, you're in your last year of the four years of residency. You just apply for a regular old anesthesia job, not specialized. You could do private practice or you could do academics. So Mass General, for example, will hire people straight out of residency who don't have a fellowship and they'll be doing kind of regular old anesthesiology. Um, a lot of times this means in private practice, it means supervising CRNAs, which are the um, registered nurse anesthetists. So kind of managing a bunch of different rooms and essentially being the point person if there's a crisis. Academics, you might be managing a CRNA and a resident. Um, that's usually the structure. So you're helping to teach the next generation and kind of managing other people in, in different multiple ORs at once. There are some private practices where it's MD only, meaning only anesthesia physicians do the cases. So you would be the one kind of doing from start to finish by yourself in a room. Um, generally for financial reasons, the, the push has been for um, MDs to supervise CRNAs at the kind of the critical moments. So intubation, extubation, you know, breathing tube in, breathing tube out. And then they're essentially there, you know, they have four CRNAs at one time that they're managing. So like literally four different rooms. Um, and at any given moment, those patients could kind of crash. And that's the job of the anesthesia MD is to be there in those emergencies. So that's sort of one model. You, you can do just regular anesthesia. Uh, a lot of people do fellowships and I think it depends on where you train, but um, certainly Mass General has a very strong tradition of fellowships. Um, and again, these are all one year. You can do cardiothoracic. Um, so you only do anesthesia for cardiac cases, for example, um, you can do critical care or ICU, which you can also get to through medicine, uh, you know, doing pul pulmonology, um, you can get to it um, kind of multiple different ways. Uh, you can get to it through surgery, you could get to it through anesthesia. You can do obstetric anesthesia, which is kind of a new fellowship. You can do a chronic pain fellowship, pediatric anesthesia fellowship, or a regional and acute pain fellowship. There are also you know, there's always kind of like new fellowships that are kind of coming around that are trying to get sort of board, uh, board certified, like recognized as legitimate. It's not the right word, but essentially that you could be board certified in it. So they're trying to do one for neurosurgery where essentially you have anesthesiologists that are super focused on just neurosurgery anesthesia. So anesthesia for patients undergoing neurologic procedures. Um, and believe it or not, I mean, the anesthesia is, is very different for all of these different fields, hence kind of the need for uh, a fellowship. And of course, people like a fellowship because it is a little bit more of job security in their mind that I have this extra layer of protection because I have had some extra training. So as I mentioned, if you do just regular old anesthesiology, whether you're at an academic center or in private practice, you're really doing the bread and butter cases. So you're doing kind of general surgery, like appendectomies, getting your gallbladder taken out, orthopedic surgeries, gynecologic, urology cases, those sorts of things. So you're the like anesthesiologist helping patients get through those procedures. Depending on the state and the hospital, how they're structured, that may also include pediatric cases, obstetrics, and cardiac cases, but you don't need a fellowship. Um, so the idea is not every state or every hospital requires people to have a cardiac fellowship to do cardiac anesthesia. Um, you'll find that in cities like Boston, hospitals sort of expect you to have a cardiac, cardiac thora cardiothoracic fellowship um, to do cardiac cases just because it's everyone is so 
uber specialized. Um, to be competitive, you have to have a fellowship, but in, of course, less um, populous areas, they're sort of like, we'll take, not we'll take anyone we can get, but you know, they just don't have the luxury of having people who are also cardiac trained. Um, the OB fellowship is becoming more popular because um, hospitals, in order to have this very coveted certification um, and status amongst hospitals, they have to have an OB certified anesthesiologist on staff. So um, to become like that sort of super accredited hospital, uh, you actually have to have an OB fellowship trained anesthesiologist as part of your staff. So that's becoming a little bit more trendy to do. Um, cardiothoracic is another a one fellowship you can do. It's kind of the, um, there's different special stereotypes of people who do each of these fellowships. This, these are kind of the intense people. Um, but you're essentially the anesthesiologist getting patients through various different types of cardiac procedures. So this would be like, massive organ transplantations where you're doing like heart and lung organ transplantations that are very complicated involving pretty much every aspect of physiology, anything like, um, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. So ECMO, you know, um, these sort of life support, um, types of, of interventions, balloon pumps, any sort of interventional cardiology procedures. I'm sort of putting the words here. Don't worry about what these mean, but basically valve repairs in the heart, um, any kind of um, electronic devices in the heart. So helping patients get through those procedures safely. And also they actually do echocardiography. So um, taking kind of taking uh, ultrasound pictures of the heart, cardio cardiothoracic anesthesiologists can get certified to do that and often do in addition to like cardiologists. So you know, you, you would be working with uh, cardiothoracic surgeons and cardiologists, kind of depending on what procedure you were doing that day. Um, the, the idea is like a surgeon could not be focusing on their surgery and also be doing the anesthesia. Um, the, the anesthesia is very complicated for these procedures. Um, and it's kind of mind boggling, even as an anesthesia resident, how complicated this is. So, um, it makes sense that there's kind of a, a fellowship to really dive, dive into this. Um, one thing that's very trendy as well these days is to do two fellowships, um, which is kind of crazy, but people do a cardiothoracic fellowship and they also do an intensive care or critical care fellowship. The idea is these are going to be people after these fellowships, they're going to be incredibly skilled at being in the cardiac ICU. So kind of the sickest of the sick heart patients. Um, that's who you, you would care for as a, uh, a cardiac intensivist as they call them. So, um, critical care and cardiothoracic anesthesiologists tend to kind of have that same personality. They're, they're kind of intense, they're very smart. Um, and this is sort of what a, um, like a typical, you know, critical care bed looks like this is not, not in the U S I just stole this picture from online. Cause it had the most equipment, but you know, one thing to keep in mind in, in the critical care unit, um, they're like incredible critical care nurses that set all this equipment up, but essentially in the OR, this is exactly what you're doing. So all of these pumps that you see on the left side of the screen, um, those are actually syringes with medications in them. And then they're kind of feeding into the patient and they have a bunch of these different medications going in at any given time. They're on a ventilator. They're on all these other mechanisms of, you know, artificial means of, of life support. This is kind of like our bread and butter. You know, we do this voluntarily to patients every day when we do surgery, right? People are essentially in an ICU in the operating room because they can't breathe. We give them medicine to paralyze them so that they don't move. They're asleep, so they don't know this, but they're paralyzed, you know, so we take control of their breathing. We support their blood pressure. We give them blood, all of these things. Um, it's kind of like a little mini ICU every time you're in the operating room. But when you are in the intensive care unit itself, things are even more complicated. Um, so this is a very popular field to go into. Um, in Mass General, it's kind of the most popular special uh, fellowship to do. Um, we have a very strong like critical care bend. Um, I think with COVID, of course, everyone heard about critical care and like what an important role they played. Um, keep in mind that anesthesia was 
the like number one specialty affected by COVID in terms of um, kind of the number of uh, infections and deaths among clinicians. And the reason why is, you know, the residents still to this day, we carry up and the attendings, we carry a pager and it's like the emergency airway pager. So essentially you get a page and it's this God awful sound and you have your bags with you everywhere you go. Um, and you basically run as fast as you can to wherever it is in the hospital and intubate people. Um, and you do that, whether they have COVID or not, and you're kind of the first one, only one there, right? Like putting your face next to them as they're breathing and spraying all their COVID and everything all over you. So it is, um, it is like, it's a, it's a challenging specialty to be in, I think at this time, um, and certainly critical care kind of saw the brunt of, of the, the COVID care, although every medical specialty was, was really touched by it, of course. Um, but it is a very, um, it's a very rewarding specialty if you do decide to go into it. Obstetric anesthesiology, as I mentioned, is becoming more popular just because to be accredited, fully accredited um, and kind of have this special seal as a hospital, you have to have an OB anesthesiologist there. It's, it's interesting. It's so different from cardiac or critical care anesthesiology. A, a lot of what you do is ep are epidurals. So again, remember anesthesia is not just putting people to sleep, but it's sort of pain management, right? Patient comfort. That's kind of how we think of ourselves. Um, so the epidural anesthesia for obstetrics is that we're the ones who are doing that, not the, the OB guys. Um, so then the other big part of it is kind of cesareans, so C-sections, whether they're scheduled or emergent, we're the ones at the head of the bed getting patients through that. It's not a very comp, generally, um, it's a pretty uncomplicated, straightforward procedure for an anesthesiologist. Um, you actually put in, it's kind of, you give them something that's like an epidural. They can't feel, you know, below their um, kind of their breast line and they're awake and talking right behind the curtain. You're there. Um, so it's not typically that challenging. The, the thing about obstetrics is if something does go wrong, um, it's, it's kind of terrifying uh, just because these are sort of otherwise healthy patients supposed to be kind of one of the best days of their life. Um, and when something goes wrong, it's usually goes wrong very badly. Um, so it's uh, also kind of a terrifying specialty for that reason. Most of the times things go really well and you can help people get through it really comfortably um, with your skills, but uh, it, it is, it can be very nerve wracking whenever you have an obstetric emergency. So, you know, think about things like massive hemorrhages, um, DIC, which is sort of a, a you know, um, kind of a catastrophic response that your body has um, to some sort of perturbation, um, you know, any kind of um, embolism where you get like a little bit of amniotic fluid up inside your lungs. Um, all of these things are kind of emergencies that we as the anesthesiology uh, anesthesiologists take care of um, in addition to the ob guy team as well. Chronic pain is very different. So um, most people are kind of surprised that anesthesiologists do chronic pain. Um, this is actually the field I'm interested in. People can do a chronic pain fellowship from other specialties as well. It's not just from anesthesia, but it's very much an outpatient type of experience. You're not really in the operating room. You do a lot of procedures and interventions under fluoroscopy. So basically that's that thing on the left side. Um, it's, it's a kind of an x-ray that lives in your outpatient office and you do a lot of procedures under x-ray essentially. More and more um, chronic pain specialists are kind of getting into uh, procedures that are almost like surgical procedures. So they'll actually do some stuff in the operating room um, where they'll implant uh, spinal cord stimulators, which are sort of on the top right here. And they're basically these little devices that look like a pacemaker. And they, you put some leads in, into this um, kind of along the spinal cord and it stimulates the spinal cord and kind of alters the pain transmission signals. And this is sort of the new wave of chronic interventional chronic pain therapy. Um, it's still very much a you know, chronic pain is a very difficult to treat condition. Um, it's very complex. We don't know a lot about it. 
And a lot of these procedures and interventions and devices that we use don't help a lot of people. You know, they help maybe half of patients. And it can be kind of hard as an anesthesiologist because you're coming from the operating room where every drug you give works perfectly, essentially, right? Like, you know that when you turn on the anesthesia gas, people are going to fall right to sleep. You know, if you give epinephrine, people's heart rate and blood pressure is going to go up. You know exactly how everything works and it works really well. And then you get to the chronic pain clinic and you try some gabapentin and maybe it works for some people. Um, so it's just a different, it's an art. It's an art and a science, I think, chronic pain, which is very appealing to a lot of people, but some anesthesiologists kind of want the more definite answers and they like to really see everything work exactly as it, as it should. Um, so it's, it tends to, chronic pain fellowship tends to attract kind of a different type of anesthesia resident. Um, you can do pediatric anesthesiology. So most pediatric cases are gonna be taken care of by especially pediatric trained anesthesiologists. And you may be thinking like, why isn't everyone just sort of like put to sleep with gas or propofol or something? Um, but pediatrics, I keep saying that all of these are kind of terrifying. They are in their, each in their own way, but kids especially, they don't have a lot of reserve. And if things go badly, if their blood pressure drops, if they lose blood, if they you know, aren't oxygenated for really a handful of seconds, their oxygen in their body just drops like a stone. They don't have kind of the reserve that adults have. Um, so it really does take an extra year of training to be able to manage that really safely and comfortably. Um, and of course, you know, as you do, pediatric anesthesiologists can do kind of bread and butter tonsillectomies and things like that for, for kids, but they can also do a lot of the really complicated, um, you know, brain tumor surgeries and all these other things that, um, you would hope kids wouldn't have to do. Um, I saw your, uh, yeah, the question about, um, cryoablation. So yeah, so definitely, um, chronic pain, there are a lot of different modalities that people use. So one of the things people, basically what you're trying to do, right. And some patients, the source of their pain is because their nerves are, I'm, uh, I'm kind of being very general here, but their nerves are involved in the source of their pain. So ways you can deal with that are you can numb them with things like lidocaine, bupivacaine, kind of the Novocaine you get at the dentist, right. And that doesn't last for very long, but that's one way to kind of shut down the nerves briefly. You can give steroids, which sort of decrease inflammation. So you can actually inject steroids into, in and around the nerve, um, or around the nerve, kind of bathing the nerve and quieting down the nerve. So if you've ever maybe yourself or had a family member who's had like a cortisone shot, you know, you hear things like that. That's kind of what that is. Um, and you can do those maybe three times a year. You don't want to give too many steroids to a person, but that's one option to kind of quiet down inflammation. And then there's other options like in people who have pretty persistent nerve pain, nerve related pain, you can do ablation, meaning you essentially burn or freeze um, the nerves, you know, burn with heat or burn with freezing. Um, generally the trend is to do use heat, um, for various reasons related to kind of nerve pathophysiology. Um, the, the heat actually seems to produce a longer lasting response than cold. Um, so, but that's a great question. The, and that's called like a radio frequency ablation or radio frequency lesioning of a nerve where you essentially are like, this nerve is so mischievous that I'm just gonna kind of burn it in its tracks. And it's counterintuitive because you think, well, that should hurt like heck. Um, and it does during the procedure, you, you, you do numb it a little bit, but then basically you fried it so successfully that it doesn't cause pain um, after that. It's not permanent, believe it or not, but it does last for about six, uh, six months or so. So there are a lot of like, Cool. obviously I'm biased, um, cause I like chronic pain, but, um, there are a lot of cool procedures that you can do, but the moral of the story is like a lot of these procedures don't work for every person. So it is sort of a trial and error. That was a great question. Regional and acute pain is kind of a, it's another specialty, believe it or not, another fellowship you can do. And it's kind of like chronic pain in some ways. It's a lot more, um, though, 
like blocks. So for example, if you've ever had um, uh, a foot surgery, shoulder surgery, hand surgery, um, the trend is to not put people under general anesthesia where they're completely asleep because it has a lot of risks, even in a healthy person, um, putting someone completely to sleep with a breathing tube is very risky. Um, it's honestly, probably the riskiest thing that you'll undergo for surgery. Um, uh, it's still pretty darn safe because we do it all the time. We're very good at it, but, um, if you can avoid it, that's great, especially for older patients who maybe have really bad hearts or things like that. You don't want to put them under general anesthesia where they're completely asleep. So the trend for a lot of these procedures are to do them under blocks or local where essentially you give them a shot of really long lasting, you know, Novocaine, it's not Novocaine, but the kind of the thing you get to numb your teeth at the dentist, numb your gums at the dentist, a really long lasting version of that. And you inject it into, you know, it, around the nerves um, that go to that body part that you're getting an operation on. So regional anesthesia is the team that kind of lives on the orthopedic floor every morning. And from about six until five, 6 a.m. to 5 p.m., they just do blocks all the time. So every person who's coming in for shoulder surgery, every person who's having elbow surgery, hand surgery, um, it's harder for things like hips, um, but you know, uh, knee surgery, all of these types of things, they will do these local blocks and they're very cool. You do them under ultrasound. Um, you get to use a lot of like neat equipment. The patient's awake while you're doing it and it provides profound numbness and the patient can be essentially awake during the surgery, which is really cool. Um, so that's what regional does. And for some reason, it's ended up that regional anesthesiologists who do these blocks a lot have also sort of inherited the acute pain management. So they're essentially the people who get consulted in the hospital if there's a patient who comes in and is in terrible pain. Um, so you may not... Generally, they're people who have had surgery and they're still in really bad pain. They can do things like put in epidurals, put in catheters that deliver numbing medication. So they basically do a lot of stuff with like needles and catheters and wires and try to achieve optimal pain control in patients before and after surgery. Whereas chronic pain is a little bit different, right? These are patients who are kind of going or going about their regular lives and they just have had months and months and months of terrible chronic pain. So it's a little bit of a different patient population and a little bit of different types of procedures that, that you might do. Um, so this is sort of its own fellowship for that reason. So I know we're getting to the end of everything, um, but everyone says that their field is the best field. I do feel like anesthesia is... Uh, very broad in terms of, you know, the, the populations you can work with. If you are, you know, a stereotypical anesthesiologist and you kind of are introverted and want your bagel and coffee, and you just sort of want to have deal with a sleep patients, you can do that if you want. If you um, really want to work with kids, you can do that. If you want to do critical care, you can do that. If you want things to be really intense and work really long hours, you can do cardiac. Um, if you want to be an outpatient provider and not have any emergencies, you can do chronic pain um, or maybe regional or something like that. So it's, it's very different in terms of what you want your practice to look like, the hours you want to work and the patient continuity of care. So if you like having, if you like being known as someone's pain doctor, like so-and-so is my pain doctor and I go see them every six months or something, you can do that. Um, if you would, if you're okay with sort of being anonymous and, you know, just, you just really like physiology and seeing what happens under general anesthesia, but you don't really need to be known as someone's anesthesiologist, then maybe you just want to work as a general anesthesiologist and do proceed, do surgeries all day. Um, so it's really up to you kind of what you want your career to look like. There's a lot of room for innovation. Um, that's true with any field of medicine, but I think anesthesiologists, just because they're exposed to so much of the hospital in particular, pretty much every type of surgery and because they play such a key part in kind of operations and 
management of workflow in the hospital. There's a lot of opportunities for non-clinical um, work. If that's something that you're interested in, we deal with a lot of different medications. So if you're interested in pharma or biotech, um, it's a great opportunity. And I think a lot of people really like, especially for the non-chronic pain things, you know, uh, people really like how quickly people respond to your treatment. So it's not like you give, prescribe someone a blood pressure medication, see them in three months, maybe they dropped a little bit, prescribe them a different dose or add a different medication, come back in three months. You know, you, in the OR, you give a medication and within 30 seconds to two minutes, everything has changed because of that medication that you gave. So some people really like that kind of instant feedback to know that treatment is working. Um, and the work-life balance is, is always uh, really good. You know, it's sort of one of the road specialties. I think there's additional specialties on that list now, but if you don't want a work-life balance, you can obviously create that um, for yourself if you want to work a lot. But if you are someone who wants to work four days a week or um, wants to do just outpatient medicine, uh, because a lot of anesthesia is kind of shift work, essentially, um, it really lends itself well to kind of whatever you want your life to look like. Um, and there's always a need for anesthesiologists. So there's a lot of positives. Um, this is just a slide um, about MST. I'm just going to kind of throw this in here because I've been tutoring with them uh, throughout my residency. Things that we offer, um, you know, are essentially tutoring for all levels. So from pre-med to kind of residency and boards to where I'm at. Um, and, you know, we essentially provide a custom study schedule, tutoring sessions, communication between sessions. We help be a cheerleader, um, you know, and, and give you mentor, mentorship and support. We also offer one-time strategic planning sessions, which are something that I do. So if you just kind of want a one-time just to check in with someone and see whether your strategy makes sense, um, or if you want some tutoring help with your coursework as well, even if it's not for a specific exam, we offer that too. So just keep us in the back of your mind in case you ever need help in the future. Yeah, so in terms of board scores, so um, in terms of like step one, step two scores, generally they tend to be, when I was applying kind of in the two, I think the average was like 235, 237 to sort of the places I was interested in going. So obviously very good scores, but not as competitive as perhaps neurosurgery or something like that. Um, I think anesthesia tends to value step there because there are more positions available for anesthesia than say dermatology or neurosurgery. Because if you think about it, the world kind of needs a lot more uh, anesthesiologists than dermatologists or just because there are more surgeries um, going on all the time. Um, yeah, great. Good point. So the pass fail. Um, so things like, so I, I would say that, um, anesthesiology has had a, it's typically been associated with like needing less competitive board scores. So, um, so yeah, since step one is going to be pass fail next year, and most of you aren't going to be taking it right now. Um, I would say step two CK is going to be pretty important, um, for any, any specialty. Right. But again, I would think kind of higher, you know, two, mid two thirties, high two thirties is pretty, uh, pretty standard kind of, uh, average score for, for applicants for getting exposure prior to med school. Um, you know, it's hard. I think you're probably just because it is a very intervention heavy specialty, you're probably not going to get a lot of exposure to doing procedures, but one thing that you could do is honestly, you know, any, if you're at a university and you have a university affiliated medical school, just send an email to an anesthesiologist. It's very common for there to be kind of volunteers from the hospital or kind of local college students who come in and shadow for the day. Um, I think it's really always a smart idea just to email people. If you want to do something, it never hurts to ask. Anesthesiologists are generally pretty cool people. They're pretty laid back. They like teaching, especially if they're at an academic center. Um, so it's definitely just 
email if you're interested in it. Um, if you're interested in chronic pain and what that looks like, just send an email to someone, you know, reach out to someone at your institution. It never hurts. Um, and I think generally, so one, one suggestion was sort of, you know, what do anesthesia programs like to see? They love research um, in any field. I think that's one of the nice things about anesthesia. It's not like neurosurgery where they kind of want to see research in neurosurgery and just neurosurgery. And that's really all that counts. Anesthesia is not like that. They want people to be intellectually curious and it doesn't even have to be like papers. It can just be, you were on a quality improvement project. You know, you wrote a book. Um, you, it, you know, it doesn't have to be research necessarily, I guess isn't the right word, but just intellectual curiosity of whatever sort that might be. I think anesthesia likes people who are diverse and interesting and dedicated to what they love. That's really all they're looking for. So intellectual curiosity about medicine in whatever form. That's one of the nice things about it. Um, the uh, military doctors certainly do not have a bad reputation in the hospital setting. Um, Hopkins actually had a lot. Um, yeah, this is very true. Uh, so hospitals, uh, Hopkins, just because of kind of the, the proximity, they had a lot of, um, people in the HSPS program. Um, and it is known to be very rigorous and very reputable and like, amazing candidates. I think we have one in each year at uh, MGH in our residency program. So um, it is a fantastically reputable um, scholarship. Uh, and I think, you know, one thing that'll be, it'll just be different. You're, you won't be applying to the same kind of private practice jobs, maybe right out of residency. You might have to like go work somewhere else where not a lot of your classmates are going to be working. Um, so in that sense, you know, it's going to be a little bit, your, your trajectory is going to be a little bit different from everyone else, but in terms of your training and, um, your, the way you're respected in the hospital, it's, it's nothing but good things. So I think if you're interested in it, um, definitely, definitely do it. It doesn't, it will never hold you back in any way. It will only, only help you. I just want to thank you all so much for coming to this talk. Please don't hesitate to reach out to me if you have any questions about anesthesia or MGH or any of those other places I mentioned, um, post back programs, should you do research after a post back program, um, should you, whatever, all of those things, please don't hesitate to reach out to MST and you can, you can get in contact with me that way. Um, and uh, I, it was a really a pleasure spending the last hour with you. Um, so with that, I will tell everyone to have a great night and uh, we'll wrap up the session. Thank you so much.